everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Savvy Psychologist. I'm Dr. Ellen Hendrickson, and every week I'll help you meet life's challenges with evidence based research, a sympathetic ear, and zero judgment. As the mindfulness joke goes, what do we want? Mindfulness. When do we want it? Now. Because the bean in the now of mindfulness is all the rage. And with a promise to improve concentration, mood, and energy, reduce stress, improve immune function, and even fight obesity, it should be. But to newbies, sometimes mindfulness can be intimidating, with the newly mindful left wondering, am I doing this right? So this week, here's what mindfulness is, what it isn't, and three ways to sample it. So first, there is frequent confusion about what exactly mindfulness is. So let's start with four things that mindfulness often gets mistaken for. Mindfulness imposter number one is an empty mind. Your mind is designed to think, notice, concentrate, anything but be empty. So don't ask of your mind what it isn't designed to do. Mindfulness isn't emptiness. Imposter number two is flow. Oftentimes, Mindfulness gets thought of as a state of deep concentration or absorption. And while it's possible to lose oneself in mindfulness, this state of energized full immersion is more accurately described as psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's concept of flow. Mindfulness imposter number three is happiness. While you can certainly feel happy while being mindful, and it's wonderful to be mindful of being happy, they're not one and the same. And finally, Imposter number four is relaxation. And there is a lot of confusion around this one. I've even seen mindfulness described as an oasis of calm in which our problems melt away, which sounds amazing, sign me up, but isn't quite right. In fact, mindfulness can be a lot of work. So if all these things are what mindfulness is not, what exactly is it? Well, let's turn to an expert for this one. Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, founder of the American Mindfulness Movement, started to make waves back in 1991 when he published his now classic book, Full Catastrophe Living, Using the Wisdom of Your Body and Mind to Face Stress, Pain, and Illness. And he describes mindfulness as the awareness that arises through paying attention, on purpose, in the present moment, non-judgmentally. So what exactly does that mean? Well, Kabat-Zinn has inspired a generation of mindfulness researchers, one of whom, Dr. Kristen Neff, has the best explanation of mindfulness I've come across. So picture yourself in a movie theater, she says. A movie is playing on the screen, and you're wrapped up in the story. You jump when the bad guy appears, bite your nails as the forces battle each other, gasp as plot twists are revealed. But then, in an instant, the person next to you sneezes, and the reverie is broken. Suddenly, you're back in your seat with your popcorn, and you remember, oh, I'm watching a movie. And this awareness is mindfulness. In other words, mindfulness is not thought in and of itself. Rather, it's a method for watching your thoughts. It's very meta, an awareness of awareness. And you can focus your awareness on whatever you like. You can be mindful of your breath, mindful of the thoughts jumping through your head, Mindful of what you can sense with your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, or skin. All that matters is that you're watching the present moment and that you are doing nothing to change it. Using this technique, you can watch, say, your anxious thoughts, but without getting tangled in them. And this is what I mean by mindfulness being a lot of work sometimes. So for example, bring to mind a memory of a recent humiliating moment. And now think to yourself, I really screwed that one up big time. You probably feel some embarrassment, guilt, or shame. But now, change things a little and think to yourself, I'm having the thought that I really screwed that one up big time. It's subtle, but different. This is hard, but with the I'm having the thought example, there is abstraction, acceptance, and relief. So, when our fellow moviegoer sneezes, our attention shifts from being absorbed in the movie as if it was reality to being aware of the movie as not reality. And guess what? Just as the movie isn't reality, neither are our thoughts. That's a little freaky, huh? But it's also freeing. As Shakespeare writes in Hamlet, there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Just because our brain is screaming thoughts at us doesn't mean we have to get tangled up in them. 
Instead, we can just watch our brain lob those thoughts without having to catch them. So mindfulness experiment number one is the hourglass. So remember Dr. Kabat-Zinn's definition? Paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. The on purpose part means you can direct the object and scope of your attention. So start off with wide attention. Notice without judging whatever's happening around you right now. Your thoughts, your senses, your breath. And who knew there could be so much to just sitting and paying attention? After about a minute, narrow your attention to only your breath. And notice the sensation of air moving into and out of your nose, your throat, and your lungs. If your mind wanders away, which it will, gently bring it back and focus again on your breath. Then, after about a minute, expand your attention again to that wide scope and notice everything around you. This shifting of wide, narrow, wide gives you different perspectives and helps you practice paying attention on purpose in just three minutes. Mindfulness experiment number two, watching your thoughts. This one is great for people who say they hate meditating. In this exercise, simply watch the thoughts that come into your head for a few minutes. It's totally okay if your mind jumps around or goes quickly. Let it, watch it, and don't judge it. Don't try to change your thoughts. Now, in contrast to some mindfulness exercises that involve more concentration, this one is more about awareness and non-judgmental awareness at that. And who couldn't use more practice there? Finally, Mindfulness experiment number three is mindful listening. So this is another good one for the non-judgmental part of the definition. So choose a piece of music you've never heard before or one that's familiar to you. Put on headphones and close your eyes and allow yourself to listen to every part of the music, the different instruments or voices without forming an opinion. Just listen and experience without responding. And if your mind starts getting jumpy or making a grocery list, just bring it back to the music and tune in to what you're hearing in the moment. Now, there are a zillion other exercises and meditations you can try. So just remember that sense of, oh, I'm watching a movie and use it to watch your breath, a flower, a raisin, or even a headache. No matter what you choose, simply pay attention on purpose, non-judgmentally. And if none of this works, you can always try another mindfulness joke. Today, I will live in the moment, unless the moment is unpleasant, in which case I will eat a cookie. Now, two weeks ago, we had an episode entitled, Why Are Some People Transgender? And of course, right after the recording was finished, I had a great email exchange with listener Gabrielle Hermosa, who is a transgender advocate and an all-around awesome lady. And I want to mention some of her points today. So, Gabrielle notes that gender dysphoria in addition to being a way to access care and a response to social rejection, is also a result of living in a body that doesn't match one's identity. Even if being transgender magically became culturally acceptable tomorrow, living in a body that feels disfigured would still drive gender dysphoria. And it's important to note, it's not just about genitals, it's about the rest of the body as well. Having facial hair, man hands, an Adam's apple, a low voice, or breasts, a uterus, and feminine facial features that don't match who your brain says you are can be maddening and inescapable. And what's more, while genital reconstruction is often covered by insurance providers, bringing the rest of one's body into alignment with the gender of one's brain is not. So living in a gender mismatched body is a cause of constant distress and impairment, the very definition of a disorder. For many, but not all, trans men and women. If you love the show, subscribe to The Savvy Psychologist on iTunes or Stitcher or by listening on Spotify. Or get every episode delivered straight to your inbox by signing up for The Savvy Psychologist newsletter at quickanddirtytips.com slash newsletters. And of course, check us out on Facebook to find archived episodes no longer available on iTunes, as well as savvy articles from all around the web. Now, you already knew you could buy both traditionally published and self-published books on Amazon. But did you know you can also buy a nose-shaped shower gel dispenser and glow-in-the-dark toilet paper? Whatever's on your list, Amazon is fast and convenient. And if you start from the banner on quickanddirtytips.com slash Amazon, you help support the show. 
Just go to quickanddirtytips.com slash Amazon and look for the banner. As always, thank you so much for listening. I'm Dr. Ellen Hendrickson, and next week we'll cover the hazards of being part of the sandwich generation, which in my case apparently includes misreading production schedules. So until then, the savvy psychologist is strictly for informational purposes and doesn't substitute for mental health care from a licensed professional. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you back next week for a happier, healthier mind. Mm-hmm.